everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change, because finally I got a new guest, Dana Milbank from the Washington Post. Not not one of my normal repeat guests like Norm Ornstein or Dahlia Lithwick, who are OK, they're great, too. Very authoritative and, and brilliant, both Norman and Dahlia. So this is a great one today, as usual. See? That's right, as usual. I, I'm going to say it, because when I open the show with, we've got a great one today, you know, for a change, that's a conceit. You, you see, because it's, it, it's cheeky. And what it's really saying is that all of these are great. Okay, this is the first time I've pulled back the curtain on my, we've got a great one today for a change conceit. And I hope that doesn't ruin the joke for you, which is uh, always the first joke in each podcast. But you know what? I, I think that needlessly explicating that joke makes it even funnier. And I'm not doing it again. This is the first and only time. So those of you who've just had the privilege and benefit of my over-explaining the joke, don't share that with anyone. That'll be my little gift for you. So Dana Milbank has uh, covered Congress for decades now, and I've been uh, fascinated and appalled uh, by what has and is happening in in the House. Uh, this week, the absolute worst people in the House being rewarded precisely for being the worst people, getting prime committee assignments. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who in the last Congress was stripped of her committee assignments because of uh, stuff she had said in the past, uh, a 9-11 denier. She said no plane had hit the Pentagon. She has said that the shootings at Parkland were a false flag and called for Speaker Pelosi to be executed for treason, uh, that space lasers from the Rothschild banking family had started the wildfires in California. And of course, that was crazy. Those were George Soros space lasers. Yes, they were Jewish space lasers, but for the Soros family. But this week, a 9-11 denier was given a prime slot on the Homeland Security Committee as a reward for backing Kevin McCarthy. And she joins Lauren Boebert, uh, Scott Perry, and Paul Gozar on uh, the House Oversight and Accountability Committee. Uh, that panel's uh, chairman has made investigating President Biden and his family a top priority. Gozar, you recall, lost his committee assignments last Congress after posting a, a video of him killing AOC. And Scott Perry is under investigation by the Justice Department uh, for uh, January 6th, Perry evidently being the one who contacted Mark Meadows to suggest a guy in the Justice Department named Jeffrey Clark, who might be very interested in helping President Trump remain in the White House for another term. And we get to the uh, big scary question, the debt limit. Uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, started extraordinary measures this week to buy some time, a few months, before we default. And the consequences of that are, of course, uh, potentially catastrophic. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with that. Uh, I was there in the Senate in 2011 when we came close to defaulting. and. Um, we were dealing with irresponsible ideologues then. This group, I am afraid, uh, is a much worse group and are willing to go off the cliff. Now, I explore that with Dana. We didn't find a salutary uh, solution, but there is some time, and the consequences are so dire that I, I just have to believe that some sane Republicans will step in at the last minute and uh, save the world <laughs> economy. Gee, now that I say it, I'm panicking again. I uh, Well, anyway, coming up, uh, Dana Milbank, a great one for a change. Also, by the way, next week we're going to uh, be having Joyce Vance. We're going to get off, get off uh, the House and Congress because it's driving me crazy, and we'll go to Joyce Vance, one of our favorites, former U.S. attorney from the Northern District of Alabama and, uh, of course, uh, now a professor at the uh, at law school there in Alabama and a frequent contributor on MSNBC. 
Uh, Barbara McQuaid also was a U.S. attorney here in the Eastern District of Michigan and, and a professor of law uh, at at Michigan. Uh, both uh, fabulous guests, and we'll be talking, of course, about the developments uh, in the cases against uh, President Trump, including uh, we we may be seeing indictments. We may be seeing these coming out of Georgia any any time now, hopefully uh, in the coming week. So that's going to be a great one. Now to Dana Milbank. Dana Milbank writes a column, Washington Sketch for the Washington Post, where he started working in, in the year 2000. Is that right, Dana? That's right. Uh, January 1st of 2000. The Millennium. Uh, Dana has been um, taking an especially close look at the new Republican House over the last few weeks. And I want to get his take on the new Republican majority and what appears to be a takeover of the party by the absolute worst elements of the Republican Party. Is that is that fair? Well, not only is it fair, Al, I think it's been happening, you know, year after year now. The problem is there are more and more <laughs> of the worst. Uh, so we're getting sort of a, an ever finer uh, distillation of the worst of the worst. So uh, but they really have, uh, uh, I think, at this moment, you know, they, they, what was left of the establishment and the Republican Party did wave the white flag. Yeah, I want to ask you about the numbers but first, I want to talk about the, you know, in the 15 ballots that it took to elect McCarthy, was every step of that completely orchestrated by the, this radical and irresponsible faction, or did it fall into place for them? Because it seemed mm-hmm. like it just fell perfectly into place. If you see now the committee assignments they're getting, the rules that are written, yeah, all that yeah. stuff. Did they like, for example, they split up? I mean, the Matt Gates is in the over the twenty of them. Was that like just all figured out in advance? Do you think? <laughs> I think we might be giving them a little bit too much credit to think that they could organize uh, in such a fashion. I think it's more likely that uh, McCarthy. Well, there's a really- steel trap caucus. They really <laughs> right, right. Um, but McCarthy, I think, you know, I think it's much more attributable to uh, bungling uh, on his part there. His plan was to go in and basically, you know, outlast them through attrition. He was going to bore them into submission by making them vote over and over again uh, on the floor and not be able to go uh, home to their districts and see their families. Uh, but it was clearly a miscalculation because it only gave more attention uh, to the holdouts and made McCarthy uh, look weaker. And then it was after, I guess it was uh, Wednesday night, you could, you know, you sit, you saw what happened there. He, they went off the floor and he basically said, okay, now we're going to, now we're going to cave in so many words. But he was gradually caving all along, right? I think he was gradually caving all along. You know, he certainly met a lot of their demands before it ever started. That wasn't uh, sufficient. He had gone down to, you know, a, a five member motion to vacate. But what he did after Thursday night was basically hand it over, say, whatever you need, I'm going to do whatever it takes. You know, so he, he'd lost all leverage at that point. And he just said, you tell me, give me your list of demands. These are all going to be met. And, you know, at, at one point, uh, uh, Matt Gates, who was, you know, sort of the comic ringleader of the whole thing, said they were, they were having trouble coming up with any, anything else to ask for because he had given them uh, everything uh, that they asked for. So I think the, the Freedom Caucus, as they're called, uh, I think kind of stumbled into this uh, winning strategy. I think it's more instinct than strategy on their part. They, they, their instinct, you know, you, you've seen a lot of these guys up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're bomb throwers. Their whole purpose is to throw sand in the gears of government. They are really expert at making things stop. So, I don't, you know, I don't think it was a strategy. It was a tactic, right? They wanted to be a thorn in McCarthy's side for, for, as, for as long as they possibly could. Then see what happens. And sure enough, it turned out well. I just I don't want to give them too much credit that it's re- it's really a thought as opposed to an instinct. And that is government bad. We stop government. Well, uh, OK, speaking of which they're So now they got all these amazing committee assignments. Yes. 
Can you imagine what that House Oversight Committee is going to be like? Okay, that has Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Scott Perry, Lauren Boebert, and Paul Gosart. And Jim Jordan was already there. Uh, and, uh, you know, a couple more of the, I mean, it's, it's going to be uh, absolute mayhem. And, you know, Comer, who's leading it, uh, launching his you know, press conference, said he really is going to, you know, be all about investigating Joe Biden. But in, in the end, everything he said in his, his rollout was about Hunter Biden uh, and the laptop. So this is essentially going to be the Hunter Biden committee. And you've got all the loudest, most out there uh, members of the party who will be taking turns whacking away at Hunter on that committee. So, I, I mean, it, that that is going to be an absolute circus that I think will be even more out of control than Jim Jordan's weaponization or what the Democrats are calling the tinfoil hat committee. Right. Well, OK, the weaponization of the government, it's a subcommittee. So they're going to be investigating people who are investigating them. Right. Or, well, well, essentially, right. It's, a, it's, it's called the weaponization of the government. So uh, but where do they perceive the government to be weaponized? Well, the Justice Department, the uh, uh, FBI, uh, the CIA, the IRS, which they all feel are uh, picking uh, unfairly on conservatives. So, yes, they've given themselves the authority to uh, investigate ongoing uh, investigations. When you say they gave themselves the authority. They are going to be able to subpoena what? I mean, they've given themselves the authority to uh, uh, to meddle, to issue subpoenas, to demand people uh, appear before them. The problem, of course, is that doesn't mean that the Justice Department uh, is going to respond. In fact, if there was anything to come out of the Trump administration, it was the realization that a president's uh, administration doesn't really have to respond to uh Congressional inquiries, even impeachment inquiries, uh, much at all. It's Don, Don McGahn, all yeah, of that. Right, right. It's it's quite easy to run out the clock on all of these things. So they they kind of, uh, unfortunately for uh, their own strategy, left behind the roadmap of how to uh, resist their strategy. So I suppose they can they can hold uh, everybody in the Biden administration uh, in contempt of Congress and then turn it over to the Biden Justice Department to enforce the uh, contempt of Congress. You're right in pointing out that, uh, you know, they've given themselves these powers. That doesn't mean that translates uh, into actual power. It'll be the it'll be the ability to certainly make a lot of noise. And of course, how many of them are in contempt of Congress by not answering the January 6th committee? Right. Well, that that came up. And then there's the the question of the uh, I think it's a half dozen current members of the House Republican Party sought pardons from President Trump for their role in January 6th. This is where you get into uh, they're they're basically investigating the investigations into themselves. What are they going to try to have access to that they will be able to get access to 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 check on the investigations of themselves? <laughs> right. Well, it's uh, I mean, what what they'll I, I mean, I'm sure that they, they've already done the, you know, uh, preserve all your records and will be demanding every document. You know, this is where the battle will be uh, played out over the coming year. We've been through these sorts of disputes many times. They, you know, they'll demand every document that the Justice Department ever produced, and the Justice Department will return to them a completely unsatisfying number of documents that don't say much. And then if it passes prologue, it'll you know, go to court and they'll fight over which documents are uh, protected by uh, executive privilege or uh, uh, which ones are responsive to uh, their various subpoenas. But, you know, so I think We'll be talking about the constant demands for testimony, for documents from the Biden administration. Uh, the Biden administration is very likely uh, stonewalling of that. Uh, and the other thing that the, uh, Jim Jordan at least claims Republicans have, he calls them whistleblowers. Now, whether they're actually whistleblowers who've seen wrongdoing or they just don't like uh, what they've seen in the Biden administration, but they'll have you know, figures from within the federal bureaucracy up there to testify yeah, they, they had this thing where they complained about the FBI during their investigation of the Trump campaign's ties uh, to Russia, and Bill Barr uh, appointed a, uh, a prosecutor to look at that, Dunbar, and, uh, in, you know, in terms of, of that, and that didn't, that didn't uh, pan out. Right, and he has largely come up empty. Pretty much. I think there was one like FISA warrant that shouldn't have been 
put out yes, there. there are, right. There was a, yes, uh, but there was, you know, not, there was, there was none of the, uh, nothing with, at least so far has been found in terms of the, uh, high level officials in the justice department, uh, doing anything on tort. To me, they're really, I think, talking to their base, right? Their MAGA base when they do these things. And, and, and what I wonder is, is how is this all going to look to the American people? over the next two years. Yeah, well, I, I think we got a, a pretty good clue of that because uh, Sean Hannity came to the uh, Rayburn Room right after Kevin McCarthy's uh, speakership victory, if, if we can call it that, and did a town hall from there under the George Washington oil painting. So I just went through the transcript and looked at you know how often they said certain words. So the economy was mentioned, I think, twice. Jobs was mentioned once. Inflation was mentioned once investigations came up 20 times. So I think what the American public is going to see is probably by an order of magnitude, what this new Congress is talking about is not about the economy, uh, not about uh, inflation, you know, not about uh, uh, Ukraine and foreign affairs even, but about uh, investigating the Biden administration. It seems to me that uh, voters will say, is, is this what uh, we in fact asked for is a Congress devoted entirely to investigating the executive branch. I, I think, hear me out here, people care about the economy. True enough. Okay. <laughs> I, I've heard this said before. Yeah. And what I wonder is, is what percentage of the Republican caucus are just nuts or are MAGA? Because it, it seems to me that it is such a large percentage mm -hmm. and that so many of them are in safe districts yes, and don't care because they don't care. They care about themselves and their being there and their power, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there are actually some ways to measure this, you know, you know, look at who voted to uh, overturn the election. Well, 139 Republicans. Okay. But Right, but who's counting? So, so we've got <laughs> what? about about uh, two thirds of the caucus. So you asked how many are nuts. I'd say, well, okay, about two thirds of them. And we've seen a similar number on on other votes. You know, will be a must pass legislation. You know, like we had at the end of the last Congress, without which the government uh, will shut down. We'll go into default. Cataclysmic consequences. You get about one third of Republicans voting against catastrophe, and two thirds. Uh, voting to bring on a uh, catastrophe. So I think that's roughly the proportion you're dealing with. That one third of Republicans, you know, the old Chamber of Commerce Republicans could, in theory, govern with two thirds of the Democratic Party and have a real, uh, you know, working uh, sane majority. It's just that's not in a million years going to happen because uh, those who those who did that would soon be booted out of their party in primaries. And you're right, 95 percent of all members of the House, but, you know, Republicans as well as Democrats are in safe uh, seats, you know, whether that's, you know, just because of naturally occurring things, you know, a lot of Democrats live in cities or because of uh, artificial things like gerrymandering. But, you know, so that means for 95 percent of uh, the Republicans, the only threat to them is going to be in a party primary. And one of Kevin McCarthy's many concessions was that his super PAC, the Congressional Leadership Fund, is no longer going to play ball in in safe Republican primaries, which means that the Club for Growth and the other really extreme MAGA type groups are, are going to be unopposed so they can put their money behind the craziest candidate in the race. And that's, in, you know, safe, safe seats are 95 percent of the seats. So we're going to, that's why we're going to have ever crazier waves of Republicans uh, admitted to the Congress. They're not in the in the relatively few swing districts. They're getting crazier in the red seats. Let me ask you how this might Play. The thing I'm most worried about, and I think Americans should be most worried about, is the debt ceiling. I mean, I, I don't think that would be a surprise to you. I was there in 2011 mm -hmm. when we went up to the last minute and it actually cost us you know, billions of dollars and because it came so close. Mm -hmm. And we got a downgrade of our bond rating from S&P. And to me, this is sort of like looking ahead, the most important, and this is going to come up in the not 
that long a distant future, right? Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is a, it's a totally artificial crisis, as you know. That you know, arguably, this you don't even need to have these uh, votes to approve the uh, the increase in the debt limit. Well, you do. Well, because because we've because uh, you know, we've they, decided to do that. They've established right. There's there's no what I'm saying is there's no like underlying fundamental reason why that has to be the no. case. Other than everybody got together and said this 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 would be a good idea. It was automatically raised all along mm-hmm. until uh, they decided to use it. Uh, 2011 was the first time I think that mm-hmm. it really seriously got to the brink. Right, that's right, and you know, figures, you know, great liberals such as Ronald Reagan said it's nonsense that we're you know having arguments over the, the full faith and credit of the United States. But here we are uh, again, and it's it's probably more consequential than ever because. Thanks to uh, Kevin McCarthy's concessions, it's now baked in the cake that they have to extract uh, extraordinary uh, concessions. They want to basically rewrite spending for the current and future years, uh, get get spending back to uh, levels from two years back, which would, I think it amounts to, I don't know, something like 17% across the board cuts for all of government. Or if, if the Pentagon is going to be protected from that, then you're looking at cuts of double that to the, uh, the rest of the government. And that's going to include... Uh, Social Security uh, and everything else. So, you know, Kevin McCarthy can't even manage a simple vote like they they wanted to have a symbolic vote to uh, honor the service of police officers. They had to pull it from the floor. They they couldn't muster the votes uh, for that. So nobody thinks McCarthy is going to be able to thread the needle here. And what's already started happening is you've got the relatively few Republican moderates that there are like Brian Fitzpatrick have begun to talk to Democrats uh, about how to you know, do a discharge p- uh, petition. There are various other parliamentary uh, tricks you could well, do. Explain a discharge petition. That is basically saying that you put a bill on the floor, right? Yeah, basically, if you, if you can get enough members of the House, you know, to, to sign on to do this, you can force a bill onto the floor. And there are other ways to do this. There's something called uh, calling the previous question, PQ in the in the lingo. How often is that done? How often I, is it, it done? I, I, pr- approximately never. Uh, yeah, that's both, what I worry. Both, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm both worried. extremely difficult to do. What's happening now, you know, from what I understand and what I'm told is Kevin McCarthy is very privately hoping and praying that a district petition can come through because he can. there's no way he can get out of this jam. He's got a choice of, you know, listen to his crazies, which will inevitably bring about uh, a default on the debt because, I, the, you know, the demands will just be preposterous. There'll be no way to meet those. And why don't we talk about what that would mean to our economy, to yeah. the world economy, Right. The truth is we have no idea because it's never happened before because the, the consequences are too catastrophic to uh, uh, to contemplate. So uh, uh, but, yeah, suddenly all of our uh, debt is much more expensive. We, you know, the, the dollar loses its uh, place of prominence in the world. We don't know what kind of shock it can set off that could bring about uh, recession and worse. The dollar is the default currency in the world, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Now it'll be it'll give new meaning to default if the default currency defaults. Yes. Mark Zandi, chief economist of Moody's, says that a prolonged impasse over the debt ceiling would cost the U.S. economy up to six million jobs, mm-hmm. wipe out as much as fifteen trillion dollars in household wealth, and send the unemployment rate surging to roughly 9%. All we know is it would create a huge economic shock of the sort we have not seen before, so we don't really even know. I mean, that's why nobody has seriously contemplated, uh, except for a relatively small number of Republicans have contemplated doing this before, but now they're very much in charge. And uh, McCarthy either decides, I follow the Freedom Caucus off the cliff of default, or I push back against them. And that is the very last thing I will do as a Speaker of the House, because, you know, the next day there will be a, uh, uh, a motion to vacate the chair. And, and that, that one member can do that. Any one member can do it. And if you have more than four, as, as all Americans have seen over and over again now, if you have more than uh, four House Republicans against McCarthy, they can dethrone him by voting with Democrats to uh, defeat him. Now, again, he can work with Democrats to survive uh, a motion to vacate the chair. He can work with Democrats 
uh, to pass a clean or relatively clean uh, debt limit increase. But that, then he's effectively abandoned his ability to be the speaker. He would have he would have lost all the support of his party and he would have even less power than he has right now. Is there a scenario where Democrats say we have he's our speaker <laughs> or or <laughs> does that happen? Well, yeah, not not without, you know, a huge concession. So, I mean, I think this is more in the realm of theory than you know, the possibility. Of course, he could reach out to Democrats and say, you know, I need X number of votes to get this uh, debt limit through. And in exchange, I'll bring up the following pieces of legislation uh, and, and Democrats could then work with him to. Uh, uh, defeat a motion to vacate the chair. So you, in theory, you could see that happening. But as a practical matter, the moment he does that, he's lost all of his power anyway. First of all, he's never going to be reelected. He'd never again be nominated uh, by his caucus. And then it would just be open warfare between the Freedom Caucus and him and probably a lot of other Republicans who would be uh, pissed off about it. So he, he may keep the speakership in title, but he would not have any power. It would just be open warfare every day. But he could prevent a worldwide. Correct. Correct. He could. He, he could. He could. He could fall on his sword and prevent calamity and and move on. Move on as John Boehner and Paul Ryan did. I think that's kind. Of, I mean, how long do you see him lasting? I, you know, some people say they say they think he'll remain speaker throughout the year. Also, adding the caveat that he could remain speaker in name only and and, and have no power, but. Uh, you know, there's not until this uh, vote, which probably can be put off till July, there's not a lot of reasons Republicans would have to dethrone him. You know, it's a lot of messaging legislation and, you know, the, the investigations uh, we were talking about. Like, there's not really a lot of must pass legislation that has to happen. Well, in fact, there's none in a way. Okay, none, none is not is even less than not a lot. Yes. Yeah. The, the spending bills will need to be passed by later in the year. But yes, there's nothing really uh, during the spring that is that absolutely has to go through. Well, I mean, but the, we have a Democratic Senate that won't pass anything that the House passes, mm -hmm. and a Republican House that won't pass anything the Senate passes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it seems like there's one piece of legislation <laughs> that this whole term is going to be decided by. Well, yes. I mean, uh, up through July and then, you know, look, the, the, the current year's spending runs out in uh, September. So that, that'll be followed shortly by, you know, the next government shutdown crisis. That's what Republicans and Democrats worked to avoid in December passing this uh, through till September so that because they knew that Kevin McCarthy could obviously not be handling that. Could you imagine if Kevin McCarthy were trying to get that through the Congress right now? It obviously wouldn't be possible. So, uh, yeah, those are the two major things we can see now. But we don't know what other war may break out, uh, you know, what other natural disaster, what national emergency could require some sort of action that, you know, suddenly you do have a must pass piece of legislation and you don't have the ability to pass it. So, uh, you know, it, it is possible that, uh, you know, indeed, it's likely there's always some sort of crisis or another. We just don't know what it'll be yet. Speaking of wars and crises, Marjorie Taylor Greene is uh, kind of famously pro Putin, right? Uh, it would seem that way, you know. I know she appeared with Nick Fuentes, uh, who is what, what's the White Nationalist Conference at that, and he he's kind of a, a Putin fan, right? Yeah, I mean you see it in in the you know her pretty stalwart uh, opposition to more aid for Ukraine. She mocks it as the fifty first state. You know, it's short sighted. Well, you know, <laughs> calling her short sighted. <laughs> But I, I is that this is such a good bargain for us, the money we're spending in Ukraine, if you think about it, because, you know, what was about 40 billion last year and 40 billion this year. And that's like, I don't know, five, six percent of our defense budget. And Russia is our second biggest enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, next to yeah, China. Right. And what do we get for this? Well, we've got 100,000 Russians dead or 
and or wound, wounded and and we've got all their weapons being destroyed and we don't have to have a soldier on the ground yeah i mean wait, if you if you're thinking about it in those terms of it's it's a it's pretty good way to leverage your uh your power and of course the europeans are paying more than uh their usual uh share for doing this and yeah it's been a, you know a huge embarrassment for putin Usually, uh, you would think that the American government, but in, in Congress, they would like to back uh, a winner. So, you know, the uh, Zelensky, the Ukrainians have, uh, you know, given all kinds of reasons to uh, uh, to celebrate uh, and rally around. So it's actually kind of difficult now to uh, take the position. That- well, I think uh, that's right. I, I mean, I think the response to him at the State of the Union, there were very few sitting on their hands. Right. There was an imbalance in what was going on. I was, I was watching from the chamber, you know, for, for exactly such uh, hand sitting. And, you know, there was a little less enthusiasm, but basically you had a large number of, uh, you know, the crazy caucus of the Republicans just sitting it out entirely. They weren't there at all. But yes, yeah, so the effect in the House was to give him the adulation that uh, he seemed to deserve as this, uh, you know, extraordinary wartime leader that nobody expected uh, would emerge. Yeah, well, you know, he's um, the bravest man in the world. And of course, because, you know, he's a comedian Mm -hmm. (laughs) and Jewish. Look at that. Yeah. And a Jewish comedian went into politics. So there you go. It's a formidable combination. Yeah. Somebody, Somebody here ought to try that. So who are, tell me about the players that were involved, like, like, uh, Scott Perry. Now is Perry going to be sitting on one of these committees? Oh yes, no, he's going to he's going to be he's on the Hunter Biden committee. Yeah, the uh, Oversight and Accountability is called. Okay, now tell me a little bit about him because wasn't he pushing for Jeffrey Clark? Isn't he the guy who talked to Mark Meadows for Jeffrey Clark to be the guy who stepped in in the Justice Department? He's the current head of the uh, Freedom Caucus. He's not out there all the time like Gates uh, and Boebert. Yes, he had, he, he was uh, heavily involved in January sixth. You know, he as you probably saw with you know from some of his nominating speeches during uh, the McCarthy battle, he's a little more careful than some of the other members. But he's not the top of my list for uh, characters who are going to uh, inflame the situation. But you know, he, he, so he's so who, who's at the them. top? Well, I, I mean, obviously you saw Gates. Uh, you saw uh, Bobert Green will be back, and she's being called uh, Benedict Arnold for not joining them on the, in the in the McCarthy battle. You know, somebody they, like, think about Paul Gozar. You know, a man with just absolutely nothing to lose. He's on that uh, oversight committee as well. He's the one who you know had that uh, anime video of him uh, killing uh, a- AOC. Uh, he's the one who right. is bad judgment. I thought frequently at. Uh, uh, white nationalist conferences, QAnon conferences. He has come out. In fact, this is in, in recent months talking about the huge danger of fluoride in the water supply. Like <laughs> that, I, that, like that's a conspiracy from another time. That's Doctor Strangelove, isn't that? That's right. He's back. Uh, you know, sixty years later, uh, and and Gozar was a dentist, <laughs> so now he's really now he's oh opposed, yeah. Did, so now he's opposed to fluoride in the uh, uh, in the drinking water. He is not saying it's for mind control. He just thinks it's really bad for our health. So uh, you've got uh, Andy Biggs, his, uh, his his brother in Arizona, uh, another guy with nothing to lose, who you know threw his name into contention. To, you know, he was the original stalking horse. Well, let, let's talk about the uh, weaponization of the government uh, subcommittee, uh, which now Jordan chairs that, right? In addition to judiciary. Right. He chairs judiciary and uh, weaponization. They're going to be looking at specifically what cases. Do you know? Well, it might be easier to to say what they wouldn't be looking at. I mean, okay. you know, it's, it's, a completely, uh, it's a completely wide open uh, portfolio. It is anywhere they perceive that the uh, government has been weaponized against them. So uh, IRS, uh, FBI, DOJ, uh, CIA definitely uh, includes the uh, uh, the use of uh, 
Twitter and social media, uh, supposedly against conservatives and, and Trump Republicans. Yeah, I, I mean, that basically is the whole gamut. I think it probably is everything except for the Hunter Biden stuff, because that would be the House Oversight Committee, although it would not be a terrible surprise to see multiple committees going after that the way they did uh, with Benghazi. And what is their ultimately is their case? I, I, I have not followed the Hunter Biden stuff. What's the there there? Well, they keep saying they're going to get to the big guy, and that's uh, that's that's his father. I try to keep up with what it is. I you know I think the American public, you know, everybody you know, he has Hunter Biden has vir- virtually uh, universal uh, name ID. It's kind of baked into the cake that you know, guy. He's he's been an addict, and uh, he's done a lot of sleazy stuff. May well have done illegal stuff. That's what the, the Justice Department is investigating. So the, I think the question becomes, you know, if Republicans are just pointing out that Hunter Biden is an addict who did a lot of sleazy stuff, they're not going to advance the ball a whole lot. It will be an effort to say that, in fact, Joe Biden is uh, 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 corrupt to the core. And, and this, this is their way into that. Now, you know, I, you, you know, Joe Biden quite well. I've been covering him for 30 years. He, there's a lot of bad things you can say about Joe Biden and his not inspiring sometimes yeah, his gaffes and his public speaking and what you know, but uh, corrupt to the core isn't what I think. Yeah, it's just not. That's not. That's not his game. Uh, so um, wish them well, but, but it just that's not Joe Biden's designated flaw. They can presumably keep going on and you know demonstrating him to be senile. That would be an easier door to push open than. Uh, deciding that he's in he's in fact completely in command and hugely corrupt <laughs> i mean he's not senile he's just, he's just no he's, well that's the, but that's the, you know that's the thing i i've been covering him since 1995 and i i you know i've gone back to the stories i used to write he would forget things and say ridiculous things all the time that's what he did that's his that's his stock in trade He is always, you know, was always putting his foot in his mouth. He was always, I mean, in judiciary, remember, I mean, he would go on and on and on. And it would be, you know, 30 minutes into it, people, legs are up, people are ready to nap. And he's like, and now I'm going to go into my speech. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I was at a number of events where he did that while he was vice president. Yeah, Yeah, I remember once uh, I was at a dinner where the MC said something like a successful dinner in, in DC is when you get out at nine. Yes. <laughs> and uh, this, this dinner was, it was Mondale and Carter and they were there to discuss the vice presidency because Mondale had really invented the modern vice presidency. And uh, of course, Biden is the vice president at the time. So uh, he's been invited to speak and uh he talked a long time he uh he spoke for like 40 minutes and i was one of the speakers at the end i said look it it was coming on 11 and i said the reason that we're not getting out at nine is not Uh joe biden's fault Uh uh-huh his is the reason we're not getting out till 11. Got a big laugh. Yeah. He had left. It, yeah. Right. It wasn't that big an exaggeration even. So. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. And I saw him do that many times. So mercifully, during uh, the last presidential campaign, because of COVID, he was not, th- that didn't happen. He wasn't on the stump. Right. right. Going on and on and on. He had prepared speeches and they saw that it worked to go sh- not too long. Right. I mean, and given given his propensity to step in it, it's really extraordinary that he hasn't had uh, more of those moments uh, in his presidency so far, because he does get out there and, you know, answer questions. And each time it's like, you know, playing with a loaded gun. You just don't you just don't know what's going to happen there. But now, you know, he has a record infrastructure. Trump didn't get that done. Uh, the chips deal. Uh, you know, addressing China, you know, part of that record is the Inflation Reduction Act. That's what it's called. I'm not sure if that was the best name for it. 
there's so many good things in that and that in in this last cycle that we didn't see. In other words, that hadn't happened yet. Right. So in terms of Medicare negotiating with pharmaceuticals, just the cost of insulin for seniors, caps on with seniors, that stuff. And then all this stuff that's addressing climate. So yeah. he's going to have a lot of stuff to point to. Yeah, I think you're going to see that. And I mean, who knows? It's, it's difficult to predict the economic future. But what we've seen lately is a, a, a cooling of inflation without the, you know, with the job market still going gangbusters, which suggests that, you know, a soft landing uh, is at least possible. So, yeah, it's yeah, I mean, from where we sit here, you could see a relatively healthy economy uh, next year. People are starting to see the, the improvements you talked about, you know, rural broadband, the uh, and electric cars, all kinds of you know things actually becoming uh, available to people. And then you will definitely see the uh, the Hunter Biden committee as the alternative. Right. And so optically, I think that's good. It's just, you know, of course, he's going to be 18 months older. <laughs> that's true. So I, I, you know, but, um, you know, so far, uh, so far, he's doing pretty damn good, I think, I think. I, 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 and there's been no deterioration. I can, I can assure you he is the same man I saw in 1995. Well, there you go. There you go. And you've been watching pretty closely. In 95, you were working for New Republic or something? Uh, it was actually the, the Wall Street Journal. I was up uh, covering, covering Congress for the, for the Wall Street Journal back then. Well, you've been covering it for a long time, and this is an interesting time to be doing it. But I, I, I think it all comes down to how this debt ceiling is handled. Yeah. No, I, th I, th I think you're right. That's the big event. And when when are we talking about June? Uh, I think you know you never know exactly. We, they, I think just today they've started extraordinary measures to keep the. That was uh, today, yeah, yeah. But today uh, is so, Thursday for everybody. Yes, yeah, so you never know exactly the date. The, the date certain, but yeah. We're what is an a, what, what extraordinary today. measures are there? Is paying certain things and not other things? Yeah, or? Rob, robbing Peter to pay Paul, and you know prioritizing uh, you know which debt you repay, so you technically don't default on anything. So I'm very glad I don't have to cover that stuff because that, that's lost on me. Well, thank you, Dana. Well, thank you for having me. I, I miss you. I miss you in the, in the Capitol. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. 